and pray now. Amen. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this wonderful day, Father God. We thank you for another blessed week that you brought us through. Father God, we thank you for every opportunity that we had and took advantage of us, sharing your love and your gospel to everyone we came in contact with. We thank you for allowing your spirit to live through us, Father God, demonstrating your love and your power in this world as we continue to build your kingdom, Father God, the direction of your Holy Spirit. Father God, we thank you and praise you for this wonderful time that we gather together. Father God, I ask you first to forgive us of any and all sins that we've committed, Father God, and those who have sinned and committed and trespassed against us, Father God. Lord, we pray that you will cleanse us right now as we present ourselves before you, Father God, as holy and, and sanctified, Father God, that you may speak to us. Father God, you may continue to instruct us, Father God, in this journey that you have placed us on upon this earth and our salvation is being continued. We're going to from perfection, Father God, in your name. Father God, we thank you, Father God. We ask you, Father God, to minister through me, Father God, that all the words that I say in my meditation, my heart, my mind, my actions, my words will only be of you and through your spirit, Father God. We pray that you will open every heart, every ear of every listener. Father God, on the airway now, Father God, I pray that your spirit will give us revelation that you will speak to us directly, Father God, causing us to grow, Father God, and continue this perfecting father god as you have caused us to be your church father god and may demonstrate your kingdom here on earth father god we thank you we honor you in your precious holy name amen amen, amen. so i had a wonderful week i hope you guys had a wonderful week as well um we're going to continue this we're talking about our relationship with god and really knowing god and what this means as a, as a believer and how we should demonstrate this Last week, I think we ended by God want us to stop dating him. And we talked about the beginning of that before we got to that point, and that was the Holy Spirit. God knows it wasn't me, that as a Christian, he dwells with us. He is God with us. And we're going to talk about that today, again, expounding that, what that means for the believer. And we said that because... Remember, going back to 2 Timothy, that all scriptures given by inspiration of God is profitable for doctrine, reproof, for correction, for instruction, and righteousness. All doctrines. So this word, the scripture that we read, it belongs to us. And anytime you read anything in the word of God, you should be able to apply it to your life. All of us. If we don't, we already know that it's just become a story. You know, Wednesday night, if we're reading about the judges and, and reading about the different prophets and the, and the kings there, and, and we're going to spound on that hopefully soon. Um, I love it, what, what we're doing on Wednesday night, but when I walk away from that, I have to apply that to my life and look at the life of Israel that we are, and how it, does that affect me? What am I doing? Am I repeating the same offenses against God as they are? So when we read today, I want you to realize and understand that this word is our word. It belongs to you. And we, God is using this word to perfect us. It's not just reading. We just don't get together on Sunday morning. It's not a religious act, but he's doing that to perfect us. And we looked at before how he used the fivefold ministry, their gifts, that he's gifted each and every one of us with the ability, God's given ability for us to carry out his will upon this earth. <laughs> And then he give us also the, the gift us with the fivefold ministry that we all will be mature Christians. And it says that we may, may be mature so we won't be blown away by every wind and doctrine. When things happen on this earth, when things happen even in the church, if you want to say that's not of God, he does not want us to be drawn away and run on a tangent. I mean, we've seen that in the past physically and spiritually. You know, people just being led away by this, this, this type of message, that type of message. But we said that we want to be able to walk away and see God in our lives and not just us, but others to see God in us. So remember that this scripture we're reading today, this is ours. We can't just look at this as a bunch of stories. It's going to apply to our lives today. So we're going to start. We're going to read three chapters. And we're going to read through it. 
and I'm gonna allow the Holy Spirit to speak. I may not try to expound on everyone, but as you hear the Holy Spirit that we just prayed is gonna allow you to see what God wants us to know from his scriptures. <clears throat> so I wanna start by you turn into John chapter 17. If you want to go on the market, we're going to do read John chapter 17. We're going to read John chapter 14, and we're going to be read 1 Timothy 1. Those are going to be our scriptures for the day. John chapter 17. John chapter 14. 1 Timothy 1. And we may read a few more in between that. But we're talking about God with us. How is God with us? God is with us. He's with you and I. We talked about that last week. Everything that we do, you know, in dating God, we don't have to run to God as if God doesn't know what's going on. You know, we'll talk about that. In the book, in, in many books, we're going to look at them later, that God will actually instruct his people that were going through hardship. He will say, just praise me. Because he's already there. He knows he's in us, in us right now. He's in our homes, in our bodies. He's living with us. He knows everything that's going on. So we don't have to date him. We don't have to run, pick him up every time something happened on a Sunday or Wednesday or whatever. And we'll talk about that. But we're going to talk about how is God with us and what does that mean? What should we do since he is with us as Christian, as believers? So if you want to title this, and we'll, I'm like, uh, <laughs> Pastor with this, you know, and, and, and Sister Jones, you want to title, it's called Living the Message. Now, we're still talking about knowing God, what is your pursuit? But now we're adding that living the message, <clears throat> being a witness, the word, and the difference between acting and being. Now, something I'm going to give kudos to uh, Apostle Mitchell when I finish getting this uh, text together. I love my journal. Y'all know me. If, if, when average, if I leave this earth, y'all, you know, somebody get my journal. But I was looking at a message that Pastor, uh, actually it's two of them, on 4 April 8, 2018, if you keep notes, Pastor Ed talked about being a witness, being a witness. That was April 18, 2018. And then he talked about on May 19, 2019, hearing and doing. And he actually asked the question, should we actually, as Christians, should we have to be doing the word of God? And being a witness, and we're going to talk about that. What does being a witness mean? But we're going to talk about living the message, being a witness, being the word, and the difference between acting and being. So how is God with us? Because one thing that we we sometimes lack and we don't at KCM. So now when I'm talking about the church, I'm not particularly talking about KCM, but it applies to us as well. So if I, you know, say something that we're not doing, you know, excuse it. I'm talking to the church right now. It's just not KCM. We're ministering to the body of Christ. Because sometimes we say to be this and be that, but we walk away with not knowing how we should do that. And at KCM, we try to teach how we should do that. So in John 17, I'm going to take my time reading this. In John chapter 17, <clears throat> these words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, this is his prayer, Christ. He says, Father, thou was come and glorify thy son, that thy son also may glorify thee. As thou hast given him power over all flesh, and that should give, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou have given him. And this is eternal life, or this is life eternal. That they might know thee, the only true God, and Father, sorry, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. So we talked about that before. When we come into relationship with God, we have eternal life now. We don't have to wait to the by and by. That eternal life is in us. It's a part of us. 
We don't have to worry about death. Death for us is only a transition. But we have eternal life with God. That is our eternal life. We don't have to wait to the by and by. We'll talk about that too. Verse four, he says, I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou givest me, gave me to do. And now, O oh Father, glorify thou me which that with thine own self, with the glory which I had, which thou was with thee before the world was. And we can preach a whole sermon about that. All he asking that he be rejoined with the Father. Remember, the Trinity is one. The Father, Son, the Holy Ghost. And the Father came through the Son on earth, and the Word became flesh. Now we asking that he be returned back. He had to come through flesh. Now he's want to go back to the Spirit with God and be one with him. He said, I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they were that thou givest them me, and thou had kept thy word. Now he said that because we talked about that in different messages. Jesus didn't just pick disciples. God picked them for him. He chose, he did as God commanded him and will for him to do. So we're telling God, he won't mind. They was the one that you chose for me to glorify you with me on the earth. And seven, now they have known that all things whatsoever thou hast given me are of thee. So now they understand that everything that Christ has done, that he has, it belongs to the Father. For I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me, and they have received them and have known surely that I came out from thee and they have believed that thou didst send me. I pray for them. I pray not for the world, but for them which are which thou hast given me, for they are thine, the disciples at that time. And all mine is thine, and thine are mine. And I am glorified in them. And now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world. And I came to thee, I'm sorry, and I come to thee, Holy Father, keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are. And we talked about before that unity that we have in the spirit, that you and I, as the body of Christ, we should be one. We talked about this one faith, one God, one baptism. And we got to go back. Remember that number one, we have to be unified in the body of Christ. Twelve. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. Those that thou gavest me, I have kept. And none of them was lost, but the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. And now come I to thee. And these things I speak in the world that they might have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them thy word, and the world hath hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Remember all that we're reading. He says, sanctify them through thy truth. How? Thy word is truth. So, you know, he sanctifies us by his word, his living word, that word that divides asunder the souls, that knows our intent of the heart, that no other man can see, God knows. His word searches there. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. As thou hast sent me into the world, even to have, even so have I also sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself that they also might be sanctified through the truth. Ne now, here we go for us. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also, which shall believe on me through their word. So now he's talking about us. 
because we believe on Christ through the word of God. So now this applies to us. It's not a story. Here we go. What is he saying about us? That they all may be one as thou father, as thou father art in me and I in thee, and they also may be one in us that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. So now Jesus is praying to the Father, not only that we be one and we be unified, but now as Christ and the Father is one, he's saying that we also may be one in us, which is now one in Christ and the Father. And we already know that. If you are, how, you are in Christ, you are that new creature. You are in Christ. In Christ as a believer. Let me read that again. That they may, that they all may be one, as thou, Father, art with art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. And the glory which thou giveth me, I have given them that they may be one, even as we are one. I in them and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one and that the world may know that thou hast sent me and thou hast loved them as thou hast loved me. So now he's saying that we are one with one another. Now we're one with Christ and also the Father. And because he is one with us, the world will now know. Now that witness can go forth because God is with us. He's in us. And I'll finish that. Father, I will that they also, whom thou hast given me, be with me where I am that they may behold my glory, which thou hast given me, for thou loveth me before the foundation of the world. Now he's saying here, he wants the disciples to be where he is. And I'm gonna give it away. He's not talking about at the right hand of the father, but he wants them to know and be in a state of being in a spirit where Christ is so that they would know the father as he does. That's spiritual. And then he says, O oh, righteous Father, the world have not known thee, but I have known thee, and these have known, have known that thou hast sent me, and I have declared unto them thy name. And I will declare it, that the love wherewithin thou hast loved me may be in them, and I in them. So now Christ is asking the Father that we be with him and in him, such as they are together, Christ and the Father. And as we're with him, the same glory that he possessed, that same glory will be in us as a believer. So the world will know that God loves them. And that God loved them so much that he sent Christ for them to reconcile them back to the Father because he wants everyone to be with the Father. And then he's praying that we would be in the same state of knowledge as Christ is with the Father so that we will understand who God is. See, Christ came that we may know God. He came to restore that relationship. He's our reconciliator. Now, I'm going to let that sink in. I got to be obedient to the Holy Spirit. A lot of stuff I want to explain, but that's up to him. Now, let's go to John 14. He wants us to be with him. We are part of him. We become believers. Christ, through God, he's in us. He's with us. And now Christ wants us to have the same glory that he had that the Father gave him Christ wants us to have that same, he ran to his father. 
that you and I have the same glory bestowed upon us that God bestowed upon Christ. That now the world will understand who Christ is and why God sent him through us, you and I. I don't know about you, but that excites me. I love those words that God says, you know, through the, his word of God, that he would not have us to be ignorant. Now, that ignorance goes a long way. We'll talk about that another time. <clears throat> so now John 14. Got to keep up with my time. Let not thine heart be troubled. If you don't mind, I'm going to read this in the Amplified, if you're okay with that. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Don't let them be distressed or agitated. And sometimes God knows we do get distressed and agitated, don't we? You believe in and adhere to and trust in and rely on God. Believe and adhere to and trust in and rely on me also. He's talking to the disciples here. In my father's house, there are many dwelling places. Some says homes or mansions. Facets. If it were not so, I would have told you. For I am going away to prepare a place for you. And when I go and make ready a place for you, I will come back again and will take you to myself. And where I am, you may be also. I'm going to give it away so to make sure we end this thing right. Christ wasn't talking about going to heaven, coming back, getting the disciples, you and I, and taking us where he is. But the place that we're going to see he's talking about is a spiritual place. Four. And to the place where I am going, you know the way. And then Thomas, one of his disciples said, Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. So how can we know the way? Same thing that we ask here today. And Jesus said to him, listen very, very carefully. He's going away to prepare a place where he's going. We know where he's going. And where he get there, he's going to come back and get us and make sure that we're in the same place that he's in. And Jesus said to him, I am the way. I'm going to let that sink in. I, Christ, am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except by through me. So where he's going is to the Father. He's going to take us to the Father. When he go and prepare this place, prepare that we can be with the Father, he's going to make sure that we're there as well. Then he says this, if you had known me and learned to recognize me, you would also have known my Father. From now on, you know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father. Cause us to see the Father. That is all we ask. Then we shall be satisfied. <laughs> We're going to talk about that later because we do the same thing today. I always ask God to show himself. If he's in us, why he got to keep showing himself? We're going somewhere. Don't get frustrated. Jesus replied, have I been with all of you for so long a time and do you not recognize and know me, yet Philip, he question mark, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say then, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me? What am I telling you? I do what I'm telling you. I do not say on my own authority and on my own accord, but the Father who lives continually in me does the works his works his own miracles deeds and power and he says seven in in in, in the next verse in 11 believe me that i am in the father and the father in me or else believe for me the sake of the works themselves if you cannot trust me at, at, at least and, and least let these works that I'm doing 
that I do in my father's name convince you. That's what he's saying. And he's saying, I assure you most solemnly, I tell you, if anyone steadfastly believes in me, he will himself be able to do the things that I do. And he will do even greater things than though than these because I go to the father. So he's saying here, when he go to the father, as you and I believe in him, we're supposed to be doing the same things that he done. And I, and I know this blows my mind too. The Holy Spirit got a minister to it, but even greater things. Even greater things. Now, if you want to look at it in the flesh, it's, it's more of us than, than, than it was just Jesus. And if the same spirit that's in Jesus was spirit of God, and he's in all of us, you already know there's a greater work, a reconciliation. We'll get to that. But he's saying if you and I, once we believe in him and accept him, we can do greater things. Because when he goes to the Father, he's going to prepare a way that you and I can be there with him in spirit. And now the same God that worked these miracles and his will through Christ is also working in us his miracles. God's working his miracles, his works, his perfected work that he will in us before the earth even was here, before we was here. Now God is working his will through us. The same way he worked through his son. How can he do that? We're gonna, I'm jumping to the end, but we're going to get that because he's in us. We got to get that here and here. God is in us. His will is working itself through us, but we have to allow that to happen. We can't quench the Holy Spirit. You and I as believers, we can do that. And we don't believe that God is with us and he is in us. We've already defeated because now we're going to go about trying to do the works of the Father, which we can't do, that only he can do through us. And we're going to fail. I'm going to leave that alone. It's time to read. <clears throat> going 13. And I will do, I myself will grant whatsoever you ask in my name as presenting all that I am so that the Father may be glorified and extolled in through the Son. Now, we're going to talk about that all in my name, because that don't mean that we just go asking for everything and God just going to do it, but it got to be in his name so that God will agree with it and God will do it. We'll talk about that. And he says, yes, I would grant. I myself would do it for you. Whatsoever you shall ask in my name as presenting all that I am. If you really love me, you would keep and obey my commands. And I would ask the Father, and he would give you another comforter, a counselor, a helper, an intercessor, an advocate, a strengthener, a standby, that he may remain with you forever. So now it kind of makes sense. So the comforter is Christ, is God. They're one, the triune. Jesus Christ did his works as he was listened to God, which was by the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit was in Christ to do the will of God. Now he's praying that saint that we will be where he is. So now he has to go so the comforter, the Holy Spirit, will dwell in you and I. So now that we ask what's of the Father in his name, he'll do it. Not what we want, but what the Father wants. So remember, he said, we just read in 17, that he's he going to go away. He's going to prepare a place so that you and I could be where he is. This is that preparation, that spiritual thing. Because you ought to read that. He had to leave so the Father could send the gifting of the Holy Spirit to indwell in you and I so that the Father himself would be in us. And he said he had to leave to prepare that place. So that you and I would be where he is. The only way we are where he is, is spiritually. We're not sitting at the right hand of the Father. I know people pray that. You know, Lord, I want to be right. We, that's not our place. That's his place. But we can be there in the same knowledge as God fills us with the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is in us to do the will of the Father, the same spirit that was in Christ. Now, you have to go back and read all the things that God commanded Christ to do by the Holy Spirit. 
And then you ought to know that great commission he asked us to go and do likewise. I'm going to let the Holy Spirit teach that. 17, here we go. The spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it does not see him or know and recognize him, but you know and recognize him for he lived with you constantly and would be in you. Y'all get that, right? We know the spirit is true because he dwells in us constantly. He lives in us. He's God, the Holy Spirit, that comforter, that truth. So we shouldn't be walking in air or confusion. We're going to talk about that too. We should not know because the, the, the great knowing one is inside of us. I'm going to just read that again because I just like that. The spirit of truth, the same thing, this advocate, comforter, strengthener, stamp, this, this, this intercessor, the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive, it cannot welcome, take into their hearts because it does not see him or know and recognize him. But you know and recognize, you have a relationship. You know God. But you know and recognize him for he lives with you constantly and will be in you. So now I understand why he said last week, it wasn't me at the end, we ain't dating God. He's in us. You ain't got to go get him, put him back, change your clothes. You know, get, you got your Sunday clothes and you got your Sunday act, just like a comedian or something, then Monday you switch clothes. No, he's in you. It's not your clothing. It's not your lingo. It's not your, your praise the Lord, hallelujah. We're gonna, and nothing wrong with that. But that evidence that he's in you, he's the truth that's living out from you. He's God. Continually. And here he goes. I love this. This is, this is for me. You got to grab this for yourself. I will not leave you as orphans. Wait a minute. How can Christ, he get ready to be crucified and dying. He got to go to the Father. He's somebody, he ain't going to leave us. When he leaves us, he's still going to be the father. He's still going to be the advocate. He's still going to be with us, but he's gone. But he's telling you and I, I will not leave you as orphans, comfortless, desolate, bereaved, forlorn, helpless. I will come back to you. For all those that think that, you know, this, I don't get into that, but he's already come back to us. Thank you, Pastor, for revelation. We went through that. We ain't got to worry about David coming back, raining on the earth. He got to put his foot down. He's in us. We ain't got to wait for that. We ain't got to act like that, that God is way somewhere in some heavenly place as some ruler that's not with us. He's in us continually. He will never leave or forsake us. And he says here, just a little while now, and the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me. Because I live and you live, you will live also as I live. At that time, when that day comes, you will know for yourself that I am in my father and you are in me and I am in you. Because remember, the intercessor, the revealer, the spirit of truth, the Holy Spirit will reveal that to us. I want you to read the rest of that. He's talking about how he's come to make his home and to a, abide in us. Because I got to run. I got I to gotta go. But please, today, if you would, just read the rest of that. He's abiding. He's living in us. He's a part of us. So now... Let's go to Tim. Well, before we get there, let's go to Acts 1. Let's clarify that. Let's clarify that. Let, let, let's go to Acts 1, if you would. We'd love to read the whole thing, but I'm going to let you read it today. We just probably read through 1 through 8 or something like that, but you, you got to read this. 
So let's clarify what he's saying. He's going to be in us, with us, abide with us forever. This comforter, the spirit of truth is going to be inside of us. The world can't conceive it, but we know him because we're with him. We're with him forever. Even though he left, he abides in us forever. And he just said in 17, that same authority, that same anointing, that same glorification that was given to the son, also he gives now to us through his spirit to do the will of the father. Now, Acts 1, it says, in the, I read this in, in uh, the former trustee I have, this talk about Paul was talking to here, have I made unto Theophilus and all, the, all that Jesus began to both do and to teach. So we're reporting all the things that Jesus began to do and that he taught. Until the day in which ye, he was taken up after that he through the Holy Ghost had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen. You remember he told them to go into the upper room and remain until the father, that gift that the father wants to give you so that you can be where I am, that you will be one in me, the father's going to gift that to you. To whom also ye shown, showed himself alive after the passions of uh, a passion by many infallible proofs, being seen by them forty days and speaking, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. So when Christ came back, he was speaking uh, after he came back after the crucifixion, after his resurrection, he came back still preaching the kingdom, and being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart. From Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, Ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost with many days since, not many days from now. When they therefore were come together and asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom of Israel? Still going back, talking about the things on the earth that he told us not to be involved in. Still kind of not knowing the reason why he came. He didn't come to overthrow a physical king. Read that discourse that Jesus had before Pilate. When he said, I'm, are you a king then? Pastor Mitchell did a wonderful job preaching that. He said, yeah, I'm a king. But my kingdom is not of your kingdom. Matter of fact, my kingdom is more powerful than yours. Matter of fact, I can call my kingdom down. Your kingdom will be nothing. It'll be obliterated. So I don't involve myself. I don't need to overthrow Rome. Rome is nothing compared to the kingdom of heaven. But we love Rome, don't we? I'm not going to get off into that. So they ask him, are you come after that, Lord, you're going to restore the kingdom of, of, of Israel? He goes, they was in captive by Rome. You got, you got to know that. And he said unto them, no, 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 no. It is not for you to know the times or the season which the father had put in my own power. But now this is why. He said, but ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost is come upon you so that ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and to the other most parts of the earth. So the Holy Spirit come upon us, not so we can go break up government. Ain't going to get into that. But so you and I, now you notice, he didn't say at a witness. He said when the Holy Spirit come upon you and I, we will be a witness. So I invite you to go back to April 18th, 2018, and look at Pastor Mitchell's uh, sermon on that. To be a witness. To be. He didn't say to act. And we're talking about really knowing God. What evidence do we have in the world or other seeds that we know Christ, that we have a relationship with God himself? And we're not talking about religious acts. So I'm going to go to 1 Peter 1. How am I doing on time? Am I getting there? Oh, yeah, we're going to spend this, I think. <clears throat> so 1 Peter 1, we're going to read a little bit about this. 
I always like to start from the beginning instead of just jump into it because so we can kind of see what was going on at that time. So Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ to the strangers scattered throughout Pontius, Galatia, Capilodonisa, Asia, and Bithynia. Elect according to the foreknowledge of God, the Father, through the sanctification of the Spirit, unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace unto you, and peace be multiplied. Now we're talking about to the elect here of God that know God the Father and have been sanctified by his spirit, the biggest, that has his spirit dwelling in them. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again unto a loving hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that they faded not away reserved in heaven for you. I like that in the Amplified that we're born anew into an inheritance which is beyond the reach of change and decay, imperishable, unsolid, and unfading, reserved in heaven for you. You are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Where when she greatly rejoiced, though now for a season, if need be, Ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations. That the trials of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perishes, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory in the appearing of Jesus Christ. I'm going to read that and amplify. I'm going to start back at six. You and I should be exceedingly glad on this account. Though now for a little while, you may be distressed by trials and suffer, suffer temptations so that the genuineness of your faith may be tested. Your faith, which is infinitely more precious than the perishable gold, which is tested and purified by fire. This proving of your faith is intended to re redound to your praise and glory and honor when Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one, is revealed. So it's talking about here when we go through hard times, that these trials, when they test us, they make us pure than gold. And they're a witness that Christ is with us. Eight. Whom having not seen, ye love in, whom though ye have not, who ye see him not, yet believing, ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. Receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. Of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently who perceive, who, sorry, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you, searching what, searching what or what manner of time the spirit of Christ, which was in them, did signify. Then it testified beforehand the suffering of Christ and the glory that should follow. So we're talking about the prophets talked about Christ being crucified and the spirit being in us but they was talking and they were prophesying of what was to come. Not for them, but they were prophesying that that would come unto us through Christ. Well, unto whom it is revealed that not unto themselves, but unto that, unto they did minister the things which are now reported unto you. By them, you have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven. Which things the angel desire to look at? And he says this. Wherefore, gird up your lines of your mind. Be sober 
and hope to the end of the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lust of your ignorance, but as ye, but as he which have called you is holy, be ye holy in all manner of conversation, because it is written, be ye holy, for I am holy. Notice he didn't say at holy. He said, be holy. For I am holy. Remember, how can we do that? Remember, because the Holy One lived in you and I. Now, if you want to look up holiness in strong concordance, it's an easy number. It's 40. It's 40. Hagios. Hagios is the definition. Forty hagios. This means sacred or holy, set apart by, as for God, the same as Christ did. So He's asking us to be holy, not act. You can't act like you set apart. If God is not set apart in you, He said the world is not going to know me. So He tell us, don't serve Him like the world did, going around acting like you know me. No, He is in us. So when he's saying being holy, he said that you and I should be set apart for God. <clears throat> We're sacred. It means different. Like a temple being different. Different from the world. It calls becoming or being like the Lord. That ain't blasphemous because the Lord is in us. Christ gave us this example. Don't have to turn there, but in John 1 through 4, Christ demonstrated this to us. He did not just come talking about or speaking about the word. It said the word became flesh and dwelt among us. That's what kind of holiness he's talking about. <clears throat> so we should be set aside for the use of God, we should be different. We should allow the Holy Spirit that is in us because he said, because I am holy and I am in you, now you have to be holy, not act like holy. But the problem is, now we're talking about the body of Christ. In the church body of Christ, we have acted holy instead of becoming or being holy. You don't have to put it on. You don't have to fake it. Now you are to be, you and I are to be holy because the Holy One lives in us. And Jesus himself just prayed to the Father. We read that, that when he went away, the Father himself was sending us himself as a promise to be in us. That the very thing that Christ did, we would do those things that even greater if we allow the Holy One, if we sanctify and set ourselves apart for the Holy One to be used by God, we are to be holy. Not that act like we're holy, not just a religious talk or going to assembly, but we are to be that Holy One of God. No, that sounds blasphemous, but that's, that, I'm talking to myself. <clears throat> Notice he does this by placing himself in us. And then he asks us, because he is in you and I, to not quench the spirit, to, but to be like him. And we just read that in chapter 17 of John. He said that I'm in the Father, and the Father's in me. And now I'm in you, and you and I are also in the Father. And then he placed it, he went away that the spirit of God, God himself will be in you and I. 
But one of the problems we see is the church has been trying to act holy. We got to dress a certain way, go to church on a certain day, all this kind of stuff, instead of being holy. Because we ask that, how do the world know that we're holy? Oh, we tell them, well, I'm pastor so-and-so. I'm, I'm evangelist so-and-so. They don't know that. That ain't holiness. That's talk. That's talk. Now, I hope I ain't making nobody mad if I am, I, you know, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. But how can we do that? We cannot do So let's put the word to us. Be ye transformed, Romans 12, 2. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God that you present your bodies, your temple. And we're the temple of God as a living sacrifice. Obedience is better than sacrifice. He didn't ask us to sacrifice. Obedience is allowing the Holy One of Israel to reside in you and I. That we will be holy, not act like we're holy. He said that our bodies are living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God. God only accepts himself. He don't accept our foolishness. He don't accept our acts of religion and holiness. He's holy. Only God is holy. So when we act in our personal lives and allow the Holy One to live through us, God recognized that. He said that he accepted it. If they step on to God, which is your reasonable service, if you say you're a Christian, and do not be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove. That's the only way you're going to prove. That which is good and accepted, perfect will of God. Remember he said in John 17 and 14 that when the Spirit come upon us, that we will be, a, he said, because he wants the world to know who God is. He, the world would know who God is through us, or the world is going to know the world going to know who we are as a religious body. They're going to know our creeds and our, our behavior. But he put his spirit in us that the world may know him, not necessarily us, but we have to become him sanctified, crucified, the flesh. I love the NIV that says that. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you will be able to test and prove what God will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. New Living Translation. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world. Even if they come on TV, even if they call themselves a church, even if they call themselves a ministry, our own, we, we only flow by the word of God and the Holy Spirit. He said, don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you and I into a new person by changing the way you and I think. Oh, my goodness. And we can line that up with repentance. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. I, you know, I don't know about y'all, but I get so tired of everybody writing, writing these books. And they tell, and they, they Ryan Christians always trying, I wonder what God's will is for me. I wonder what, how in the world, God, if he's in you, why you got to ask him his will? Let his will live through you. Oh my God. But that requires obedience and not sacrifice. See, we love sacrifices. Oh, I went to church on Monday. I went to church on Wednesday. I went to church on Thursday. Girl, I'm in a choir. Girl, I go to prayer group. That's sacrifice. But obedience, it's sanctifying yourself and you and I and allowing God himself to live through us. Let his spirit be first in our lives. So we have to look at our lives and see if we are an example of the true word of God as God is expressing himself through us that we see that transformation in our lives or do we only see certain actions? Oh, I, I know what you say. See, one may say the actions lead to this, but not necessarily. I know what you say. You got to fake it till you make it. Uh-uh. Ain't no fake it till you make it. How you going? But we do that. We've been faking God in us and hoping that something's going to come and we're going to be holy when the Holy One is inside of us, won't express himself. Ain't no fake it till you make it. Because this may only lead to religion it may it made it for it, I'm gonna leave that alone 
<clears throat> you made it the moment you invited Christ into your life. I'm going to go and say it. You ain't got to fake it. When you invited Christ in your life, the word of God just told us that he came into you to dwell in you forever. And he wanted to express himself through you so that now you don't have to act holy. You are. You are. You be. You being. You are holy. All you have to do is be. Be. Not act. Because I'm talking to myself. I'm sick. Of I'm not talking about KCL. I'm just sick and tired of going out and seeing people acting like they're holy. Because they got on a hat and a skirt and they just came from church. I'm, I'm sick of it. And if I'm sick of it, you may be sick of it. What do you think God is sick of? Don't you think he's tired? But actions may only produce religion and repetitious behavior, but not to change the way God desires. Now, we see this by looking at the life of Israel. We can truly say that. Now, I'm going to go there. It, uh, yep, only got a cute few seconds. Oh, I love Wednesday nights because it, it speaks to me. It's not just a story that Pastor Mitch is taking us through. But I have to ask myself in a life, Israel kept dating God. We represent Israel. Let's make it personal. They will come and not repent. But we still want to have we would still want to have those gods. We want to still be led by our own mind, will, and emotions. And then they would keep falling into their sin. They kept, kept trying to act like they were something, but God was trying to dwell with them so they could be something. So they kept falling in and out of God's will. Do we do that today? Do we look in our lives? Can we see only actions that one particular time in our life you know, we see it all the time. People in church and they're out of church. Oh, I thought I thought they were walking with God. I thought they went to your church. Now I see them in the street and they, see, you can't do, we can't do that. But we can't also wake up and be in God's will one moment and then be out of God's will the next. Because then he has to do something to keep bringing us in line. That is not his purpose. We do this by allowing the spirit of God placing us to rule in us, through us, our decisions, every direction, our thought, which leads to action. Now, holiness actions. Remember that God gave his spirit to rule over us. Look at us and how we are created. Look at us, how we created. I'm sorry, going back to the beginning. He formed us, this body, this physical body, and then he placed his spirit inside of us. And that, that's what gave us life. But we want the flesh to rule. We want our mind, will, and emotions, our soul to rule. When he gave us his spirit. And he has to restore this by sending his son. His son died for us for our salvation and be reconciled back to God. And then he wanted to restore that relationship. He went away and God sent himself to us his very Holy Spirit to dwell in us again. And all we have to do is be obedient to what he gave us. Don't allow the flesh to rule you. Not just your body, but also your mind and your emotions. Remember, when you read the rest of that scripture we read in 17, oh, sorry, 14, you're going to notice that all these fleshless things, he compared like grass. They're going to fade away. But the spirit that he placed in us, we just read, is forever. Obedience is better than sacrifice. Sacrifice only requires action. That doesn't necessarily require a change in our thoughts, our will, and our behavior in our lives. Obedience requires a change in one spirit and will that is seen and demonstrated in your actions and your life that is constant. That is constant. So no more excuses. 
Because Christian, we love making excuses. You know, the song say, Jones, help me out. I'm only human. I'm just a man. Lord, help me today to do all your will. I don't know the song, but we love it. We are holy people. God is perfecting his will in us. No more excuses. Well, I did that because, you know, man, I just, you know, no. Be sanctified. Be holy. Be holy. You don't have to act holy. When something happened in your life, just allow the spirit that God gave you and I to manifest itself through us. He's God with us. So as the body of Christ, we don't have to go out and act like we're holy. We are being holy. But we have to live the message. Like Christ, we have to become the word. Because the word is in us. You remember he said that word, it be, be ye transformed. That word in us will transform us by the renewing of our minds that we be holy, not act holy. It's the difference between acting and being. So that the world would know that we know God. Now, we're going to give this example, but I got to. So I was away last week, right after we ministered. Only two more minutes, uh, Elder. We went out to eat <clears throat> right, after, right after last week's service. I was, I was in power. So we went out. It was myself, my wife, Elder Marsh, and Kathy. We went out to this restaurant. We were in Supply, North Carolina. I don't know if y'all know about Supply down by Holden Beach. We went over to Shalot. So we walked in this country restaurant that somehow, and this ain't important, but I gotta tell you that we were the only people that looked like us that was in there. It was an old country restaurant and we wanted some breakfast. We wanted some, some, some stuff that, you know, y'all eat that stuff with the grease on your lips. And we walked in this restaurant and we walked in the restaurant, we walked in there, we went, the, 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 the waitress sat us down and people just looking at us. And this is not about us. I'm giving this story because we overcome by the word of our testimony. And we're sitting there and this gentleman, older gentleman, right beside us, just looking at us. And Kathy, you know, Kathy, Kathy, he just, he stared at me. And he was staring at us. This man gets up, this man said, and I got to, if I'm wrong, y'all, but this, his words is some of the stuff that we say, but it was from, I don't know he was saved or not. Nobody. Now, we didn't walk in the restaurant to my praise the Lord. Hallelujah. That girl, you know, praise the Lord. No. But the spirit of God was in us. And this man said, as people were watching, he said, when y'all walked in, now listen what is, and this word came out his mind. He said, the atmosphere changed. Now, we always talk about the atmosphere changing, but a man that didn't know us said the atmosphere changed. He said that a joy came in that it settled the place and it just felt peaceful. And then he started talking to us. And then when he got ready to leave, he stood there and talked. He said, I can not listen to this because this might, you know, I know some of y'all think this was a uh, uh, racial, but he said, I can tell, listen to this. He said, I can tell that you're good people. See, God is good. And he just said, I can tell that you're good people. Ain't nobody said nothing about God. Ain't nobody preaching nothing. The waitress came over there. We had her laughing. We was having a wonderful time. We left her a good tip and we just spoke positive things to her. And I said, God, that's what you just told us. We ain't got to go out trying to do something. All we have to do is be. And we just read that. So now that the world will know that God is and he loves them through us. Don't, excuse me, I'm sorry, I'm done. Don't have to pass out a track, be the track. Be a witness. 
by being holy. And he said, if I be lifted up in you and I, I, God, will draw all men unto me. I will build my church. I'm done. I agree. We're going to pray now. Let's pray for saints. Father God, we thank you for this word. We thank you that we are holy. As we have presented ourselves before you, as God himself lives in us. Father God, we are holy holy because the holy one of Israel lives in us. We thank you, Father. And Lord, I pray, Father God, that this message would resound in our spirits, Father God, that we would allow, Father God, your spirit, that precious spirit, that God himself that you've given us, each and every one of us as believers, Lord, that there would be no more struggles. We get up every day and we struggle because we struggle in our spirits from allowing your spirit to just have way in our lives, Father God, and just be who you created. You created us to be with you. Now that we're with you in spirit and your very spirit lives in us, help us to just be. No more struggles. No more struggles. No more struggles of trying to be holy by acting when we could just be and all of our actions will be holy. So, Father God, we thank you for the spirit you've given us, your very self. And now we say, Father God, spirit of God, live that be in us, live through us. Show yourself through us. Let the will of God, that the purpose of why you came into our lives and in us, now let us be a witness. And be holy as we be obedient to you. We don't have to sacrifice, but we be obedient to the spirit of God that you've given each and every one of us, that you say you would never leave or forsake us in any situation, and you're with us forever. We thank you. We honor you. Let this truth be a part of us. In Jesus' name. Amen.